Part 1. You will hear a radio interview about an upcoming fair. First, you have some time to look at questions 1 to 4. Now we shall begin. You should answer the questions as you listen, because you will not hear the recording a second time. Listen carefully and answer questions 1 to 4. Good afternoon and welcome to City Hour, the radio show that brings you all the latest information about events in and around our city. Today, we have with us Cynthia Smith, who is heading up this year's City Fair. Cynthia, would you start by giving us some of the basic information about the fair? Where will it take place this year? I'm glad you asked that question, because I know most people will be expecting the fair to be at the fairgrounds as usual, but we've had to change the location this year due to some construction work. You know, they're building the new high school in that neighbourhood and they've been using the fairgrounds as a place to store construction materials. So we've moved the fair to City Park, which I think is a wonderful location. Yes, that will be a great place for the fair. I understand that the fair begins on Friday morning with a special opening event. Actually, it won't begin until that evening. But you're right about the special event. Traditionally, we've begun with a parade, but this year our opening event will be a special dance performance. And the most exciting part is that the mayor will be one of the dancers. The mayor is a woman of many talents. Cynthia, could you tell our listeners about the price of admission? What will it cost to attend the fair? We're trying to keep the price down as much as possible. A three-day pass is just $25. Or you can buy a Saturday or Sunday only pass for $15. The opening event on Friday, the dance performance, doesn't cost anything to attend and we're hoping a lot of people will come to watch that. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 5 to 10. Now listen and answer questions 5 to 10. Could you tell us about some of the events planned for Saturday and Sunday, the main days of the fair? We have a lot of exciting things planned. There are a number of events, especially for children, including a clown show on Saturday afternoon. On Saturday evening, we've got an event that can be enjoyed by the whole family, a concert by the lake. I'm sure that will be a popular event. Is there anything special planned for Sunday? Yes, a really fun event. And we hope a lot of people will participate. There'll be a singing contest in the afternoon. It's open to everyone at no charge. It doesn't matter whether you're an experienced singer or not. If you've always dreamed of singing on stage, this is your chance. That sounds like a lot of fun. I think it will be. I'd also like your listeners to know that besides the special events I've mentioned, there will be things taking place all weekend. For example, at the food court, international food will be served. You'll be able to sample dishes from all around the world. There will also be special games for children at different locations around the fair. Will there be things people can buy? Souvenirs? Anything like that? We have a large area set aside where there will be crafts for sale. This will be an opportunity to buy many lovely handmade things and to get to know some of our local artists and craftspeople as well. It sounds like there will be a lot of fun for everyone at this year's fair. Thank you for sharing the information with us, Cynthia. Thank you for inviting me.
That is the end of part one. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part two. Part two. You will hear the general manager of a golf club talking to some people who would like to become members. First, you will have time to look at questions 11 to 16. Now listen carefully and answer questions 11 to 16. No, ladies and gentlemen, thank you for coming to this meeting. Demand for membership places has far exceeded our expectations this year. So it was decided to gather you all here together to go through the process step by step. Once rather than many times with each of you individually. The first thing you need to do is not fill in the application form. Uh, this, you see, is a waste of time, unless you have found an application sponsor. Your sponsor must be an existing full member of the club. Now, once you have your sponsor, you should log on to our website and fill in and send through the membership form. You will be prompted to provide the relevant deposit at the same time as you submit your application. You may do so using any major debit or credit card. The next step is for you to attend a general meeting of the club. There are typically meetings held once a month. After the club meeting, you will then be required to wait a while in order for the club committee to examine and if all is in order, approve your application. It may be necessary to ask you to come forward for an additional interview before approval is granted, depending on the circumstances. Now, once you have been approved, you are almost a member of the club. All you need to do then is pay the remaining balance of your membership fee. Having done this, you are officially a member of Blaine Row Golf Club. However, you cannot start to play in competitions until you have acquired your handicap. In order to do this, you must send in three cards. The committee will then issue you with a club handicap within seven days on the basis of how you performed in each of the three rounds you played. Before you hear the rest of the discussion, you have some time to look at questions 17 to 20. Now listen and answer questions 17 to 20. No, I won't spend much more than a few minutes on this, but let's go through the different membership types uh, quickly now. Remember, all the information I'm about to give you and more is available on our website. The first category is Full Ordinary Member. Basically, this is a full membership that gives you full playing rights during competitions, and for casual golf as well. 
It costs £10,000 to become a full member, or alternatively, four instalments of £2,500. Our next category is Associate. This is for a golfer who is already a member of a club, but wants to join ours too, while keeping his existing club as his main club. You have the same rights as a full member, but the cost is £9,000. I must remind you that there is a limited number of memberships of this kind available. Five-day members pay £5,000 to join and this payment can be put towards becoming a full member at a later date if you would like to upgrade your membership status. You enjoy full playing rights during casual play and can play in all weekday competitions. However, you cannot enter competitions at the weekend. Intermediate membership is open to golfers under the age of 25, and costs £1,800, as do the other remaining membership types, junior, senior, and overseas. If you are an intermediate member, you too have full playing rights for casual play. However, you can only play in competition if a full member of the club invites you to join him. Junior members are aged between 12 and 18. They enjoy restricted playing rights in casual playing time and are only allowed to play on Monday and Wednesday mornings. They can occasionally play in competitions, but the opportunities to play in this format are severely restricted. Senior members enjoy full rights at all times and overseas members can play on the course casually at any time and can enter competitions if invited to do so by a full member of the club. Now. That is the end of part two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part three. Part three. First, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 26. Now listen carefully and answer questions 21 to 26. Over the past 50 years, there have been some radical changes in medicine as it is known in the West. This is largely the result of vast improvements in technology, but also in the rising importance of alternative treatments. I have with me today Matthew East, a registered osteopath and a supporter of alternative techniques in healthcare. Matthew, can you tell us more about osteopathy? Well, perhaps the first thing I should say is that the term alternative is actually a little misleading, as I am referring to approaches and attitudes to health that were in common use long before Western medicine was established. I prefer the term natural. Anyway, I'll begin by telling you a little about osteopathy. Basically, osteopathy is the manipulation of muscles in order to alleviate stresses and tensions that lead to pain. Now, unlike Western medicine, osteopathy considers the whole body, not just the affected area. And this is a very important principle of natural remedies. The whole body must be considered before a course of treatment can be decided upon. 
You see, the aim of therapies like osteopathy is not only to repair the body, but also to get the body treating itself. And this does not come from treating the symptoms. To give an example, I recently treated a two-month-old baby who was screaming all day and was even worse at night. The couple had taken the baby to their doctor, but the only advice they were given was that the baby would grow out of it. However, the real problem stemmed from a difficult birth, which put pressure on the baby's neck. After ten minutes of gentle manipulation, the pressure was released, and within twenty minutes the baby was quiet and calm for the first time. This was achieved without drugs or operations. Avoiding such invasive methods of treatment highlights another of the differences between Western medicine and a more natural approach. You see, Western medicine often uses surgery in order to find solution to problems that could have been addressed with simple remedies. A medical approach that looks closely at how essential an operation is before it is performed would offer patients a considerably less stressful method of treatment, not to mention the financial savings. Natural remedies actually amount to about 10% of the cost of a Western course of treatment. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 27 to 30. Now listen and answer questions 27 to 30. I'd like to mention the subject of surgery again a little later, but I would like to say at this point that there are those that claim that the benefits of osteopathy and herbal therapies are largely psychological, that they have not undergone the clinical trials that pharmaceuticals have. To answer that, you only need to look at the example I gave earlier of the baby that stopped crying less than an hour after treatment, but was obviously far too young to react because of purely psychological factors. Another example can be seen in the successful use of acupuncture in the treatment of animals. In response to criticism regarding clinical trials, it is worth noting that the power of pharmaceutical companies is such that, although some drugs fail the standards required of them, they are sometimes still prescribed by doctors. Moving on to another point, it should be stressed that natural remedies, in addition to having no side effects, can also be applied to any patient. Now, I'm not suggesting that the same treatments are used indiscriminately. Although natural remedies can be used with any age group, the treatment selected is very specific to the person. By this I mean that not only the general health of the patient needs to be considered, but also their habits, diet, and lifestyle in order to build a complete picture. However, I am not suggesting that we should reject Western medicine entirely. In fact, there have been occasions when I have referred patients to their doctors, as I felt that in those cases it was the most suitable course of action. There are many situations in which it is by far the best option. Take emergency surgery, for example. Obviously, more natural remedies do not provide the speed required in such cases. The best solution would therefore be an open-minded combination of the two forms. Well, thank you very much, Matthew. That was a very interesting insight into alternative, sorry, natural treatments. Next week, we'll be inviting Dr. Moore. That's M-O-O-R-E e onto the program to argue his case as a doctor until next week then goodbye that is the end of part three you now have half a minute to check your answers
Now turns to part four. Part four. You are going to hear some facts and figures about Australia. First, you have some time to look at questions thirty-one to forty. Now listen carefully and answer questions thirty-one to forty. Now I should tell you that the country of Australia is made up of six states and two territories. These are the Australian Capital Territory, New South Wales, the Northern Territory, Queensland, South Australia, Tasmania, Victoria, and Western Australia. The national capital is Canberra. Right. Let's turn to the Australian economy. Australia has a prosperous Western-style capitalist economy. Australia is a major exporter of agricultural products, minerals, metals, and fossil fuels. Commodity prices have a big impact on the economy. Australia suffered from the low growth and high unemployment. Typical of the OECD countries in the early 1990s, but the economy has expanded at reasonably steady rates in recent years. In addition to high unemployment, short-term economic problems include how to balance output and inflation, and how to stimulate exports. The economy is made up like this: agriculture, 3.1 percent; industry, 27.7 percent. Services, sixty-nine point two percent. The labor force has a similar pattern. The total labor force is eight point two million. Thirty-four percent work in finance and services. Twenty-three percent work in public and community services. Twenty percent work in the wholesale and retail trade. Seventeen percent work in manufacturing and industry, and six percent work in agriculture. What are the chief industries of Australia? They are mining, industrial, and transport equipment, food processing, chemicals, and steel. What are Australia's main agricultural products? They are wheat, barley, sugarcane, fruit, cattle, sheep, and poultry. And who do we sell our products to? At present, our chief export market is Japan. Which takes twenty-four percent of our exports. After that, South Korea takes eight percent, and New Zealand and the U.S. each take seven percent. In years to come, however, we expect China to become a significant trade partner. China already supplies five percent of Australia's imports. This is the same amount as New Zealand. Meanwhile, we take one fifth. In fact, twenty-two percent of our imports from the U.S., seventeen percent from Japan, and six percent from the U.K. So, what sort of things does Australia import? Well, we import a lot of machinery and transport equipment, especially computers and office machines, also telecommunications equipment, and in addition, we have to import oil and petroleum products. So let's move to the subject of communications in Australia. We have an estimated 8.7 million telephones and 9.2 million televisions. There are some 134 television broadcast stations and 325 radio stations. The related subject of transport is naturally very important in such a big country as Australia. Let's look at highways first. There are two kinds of highways: paved and unpaved. Paved highways are regular roads with a permanent surface, but actually we have more unpaved highways, around sixty percent, than paved, when all the country roads are included. In addition, Australia has a railway network of over thirty-eight thousand kilometers. 
but you'll probably find it hard to believe how many airports we've got. Ten? Twenty? Fifty? No, the total is 443. Of course, this includes many short runways on farms and in the outback. There are only nine airports with runways of more than 3,000 meters. That is the end of part four. You now have half a minute to check your answers.